This is from my podcast, Down to Sleep, where I read books to help you get a good night's rest. You can listen for free here, Spotify, or other apps. Come and support the podcast on Patreon and get a bonus episode every single week, as well as vote on what book I read next. Hit like and subscribe, and enjoy. And we'll begin. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Arthur, the greatest of Britain's kings, holds the Christmas festival at Camelot, surrounded by the celebrated knights of the Round Table, noble lords the most renowned under heaven, and ladies the loveliest that ever had life. This noble company celebrate the new year by a religious service, by the bestowal of gifts, and the most joyous mirth. Lords and ladies take their seats at the table. Queen Guinevere, the grey-eyed, gaily dressed, sits at the dais, the high table or table of state, where too sat Gawain, with other worthies of the round table. Arthur, in mood as joyful as a child, his blood young and his brain wild, declares that he will not eat nor sit long at the table until some adventurous thing, some uncouth tale, some great marvel, or some encounter of arms has occurred to mark the return of the new year. The first course was announced with cracking of trumpets, with the noise of nakers and noble pipes. Each two had dishes twelve, good beer and bright wine both. Scarcely was the first course served when another noise than that of music was heard. There rushes in at the hall door a knight of gigantic stature, the greatest on earth in measure high. He was clothed entirely in green, and rode upon a green foal. Fair wavy hair fell about the shoulders of the green knight, and a great beard like a bush hung upon his breast. The knight carried no helmet, shield, or spear, but in one hand a holly bough, and in the other an axe, huge and unmeet, the edge of which was as keen as a sharp razor. Thus arrayed, the green knight enters the hall without saluting anyone. The first word that he uttered was, Where is the governor of this gang? Gladly would I see him and with himself speak reason. To the knights he cast his eye, looking for the most renowned. Much did the noble assembly marvel to see a man and a horse of such a hue, green as the grass. Even greener they seemed than green enamel on bright gold. Many marvels had they seen, but none such as this. They were afraid to answer, but sat stone still in a dead silence, as if overpowered by sleep. Not all from fear, but some for courtesy. Then Arthur, before the high dais, salutes the green knight, bids him welcome, and entreats him to stay a while at his court. The knight says his errand is not to abide in any dwelling, but to seek the most valiant of the heroes of the round table, that he may put his courage to the proof, and thus satisfy himself as to the fame of Arthur's court. I come, he says, in peace as ye may see by this branch that I bear here. Had I come with hostile intentions? I should not have left my helmet, shield, sharp spear, and other weapons behind me. But because I desire no war, my weeds are softer. If thou be so bold as all men say, thou wilt grant me the request I am about to make. Sir Courteous Knight, replies Arthur, if thou cravest battle only, here failest thou not to fight. Nay, says the Green Knight, I seek no fighting. Here about on this bench are only beardless children. Were I arrayed in arms on a high steed, no man here would be a match for me. But it is now Christmas time, and this is the new year, and I see around me many brave ones. If any be so bold in his blood that dare strike a stroke for another, I shall give him this rich axe to do with it whatever he pleases. I shall abide the first blow just as I sit, and will stand him a stroke, stiff on this floor, provided that I deal him another in return. And yet I give him respite, a twelve-month and a day, 
Now haste and let's see tight. Dare any herein aught say. If he astounded them at first, much more so did he after this speech, and fear held them all silent. The knight, writing himself in his saddle, rolls fiercely his red eyes about, bends his bristly green brows, and strokes his beard, awaiting a reply. But finding none that would carp with him, he exclaims, What? Is this Arthur's house, the fame of which has spread through so many realms? Forsooth the renown of the round table is overturned by the word of one man's speech, for all tremble for dread without a blow being struck. With this he laughed so loud that Arthur blushed for very shame, and waxed as wroth as the wind. I know no man, he says, that is aghast at thy great words. Give me now thy axe, and I will grant thee thy request. Arthur seizes the axe, grasps the handle, and sternly brandishes it about, while the green knight, with a stern cheer and dry countenance, Stroking his beard, drawing down his coat, awaits the blow. Sir Gawain, the nephew of the king, beseeches his uncle to let him undertake the encounter, and at the earnest entreaty of his nobles, Arthur consents to give Gawain the game. Sir Gawain takes possession of the axe, but before the blow is dealt, the green knight asks the name of his opponent. In good faith, answers the good knight, Gawain I am called, that bids thee to this buffet. Whatever may befall after and at this time twelve months will take from thee another, with whatever weapon thou wilt, and with no white else alive. By Gog, quoth the green knight, it please me well that I shall receive at thy fist that which I have sought here. Moreover, thou hast truly rehearsed the terms of the covenant, but thou shalt first pledge me thy word, that thou wilt seek me thyself, wheresoever on earth thou believest I may be found. Fetch thee such wages as thou dealest me today, before this company of doughty ones. Where should I seek thee? replies Gawain. Where is thy place? I know not thee, thy court, or thy name. I wot not where thou dwellest, but teach me thereto. Tell me how thou art called, and I shall endeavour to find thee. And that I swear thee for truth, and by my sure troth. That is enough in New Year, says the groom in green. If I tell thee when I have received the tap, when thou hast smitten me, then smartly I will teach thee of my house, my home, and my own name, so that thou mayest follow my track and fulfil the covenant between us. If I spend no speech, then speedest thou the better, for then mayest thou remain in thy own land and seek no further, but cease thy talking. Take now thy grim tool to thee, and let us see how thou knockest. Gladly, sir, forsooth, quoth Gwain, and his axe he brandishes. The green knight adjusts himself on the ground, bends slightly his head, lays his long lovely locks over his crown, and lays bare his neck for the blow. Gawain then gripped the axe, raising it on high, let it fall quickly upon the knight's neck, and severed the head from the body. The fair head fell from the neck to the earth, and many turned it aside with their feet as it rolled forth. The blood burst from the body, yet the knight never faltered nor fell, but boldly he started forth on stiff shanks and fiercely rushed forward, seized his head and lifted it up quickly. Then he runs to his horse, the bridle he catches, steps into his stirrups and strides aloft. His head by the hair he holds in his hands and sits it firmly in his saddle, as if no mishap had ailed him, though headless he was. He turned his ugly trunk about that ugly body that bled, and holding the head in his hand he directed the face towards the dearest on the dais. The head lifted up its eyelids and looked abroad, and thus much spoke with its mouth as ye may now hear. Oak Gawain, thou be prompt to go as thou hast promised, 
and seek till thou find me according to thy promise made in the hearing of these nights. Get thee to the green chapel, I charge thee to fetch such a dint as thou hast dealt, to be returned on New Year's morn. As the knight of the green chapel I am known to many, wherefore if thou seekest thou canst not fail to find me. Therefore come, or recreant be called. With a fierce start the reins he turns rushes out of the hall door his head in his hand. The fire of the flint flew from the hoofs of his foal. To what kingdom he belonged knew none there, nor knew they from whence he had come. What then? The king and Gawain there, at that green one, they laugh and grin. Though Arthur wondered much at the marvel, he let no one see that he was at all troubled about it, but full loudly thus spake to his comely queen with courteous speech. Dear dame, today be never dismayed. Well happens such craft at Christmas time. I may now proceed to meet, for I cannot deny that I have witnessed a wondrous adventure this day. He looked upon Sir Gawain and said, now, sir, hang up thine axe, for enough has it hewn. The weapon was hung up, on high, that all might look upon it, and by true title thereof tell the wonder. Then all the knights hastened to their seats at the table, so did the king and our good knight, and they were there served with all dainties, with all manner of meat and minstrelsy. Though words were wanting when they first to seat went, now are their hands full of stern work, and the marvel affords them good subject for conversation. But a year passes full quickly and never returns. The beginning is seldom like the end. Wherefore this Christmas passed away and the year after, and each season in turn followed after another. Thus winter winds round again, and then Gawain thinks of his wearisome journey. On All Hallows' Day Arthur entertains right nobly the lords and ladies of his court, in honour of his nephew, for whom all courteous knights and lovely ladies were in great grief. Nevertheless they spoke only of mirth, and though joyless themselves made many a joke to cheer the good Sir Gawain. Early on the morrow Sir Gawain with great ceremony is arrayed in his armour, and thus completely equipped for his adventure, he first hears mass, and afterwards takes leave of Arthur, the knights of the round table and the lords and the ladies of the court, who kiss him and commend him to Christ. He bids them all good day, as he thought, forevermore. Very much was the warm water that poured from eyes that day. Now rides our knight through the realms of England with no companion but his foal, no one to hold converse with save God alone. From Camelot in Somersetshire, he proceeds through Gloucestershire and the adjoining counties into Montgomeryshire, thence through North Wales to Holyhead, adjoining the Isle of Anglesey, from which he passes into the very narrow peninsula of Wirral in Cheshire where dealt but few that loved God or man. Gawain inquires after the Green Knight of the Green Chapel, but all inhabitants declare that they have never seen any man of such hues of green. The knight thence pursues his journey by strange paths over hill and moor, encountering on his way not only serpents, wolves, bulls, bears, and boars, but wood satyrs and giants. Worse than all of those, however, was the sharp winter. When the cold, clear water shed from the clouds and froze, it might fall to the earth. Nearly slain with the sleet, he slept in his armor. More nights than enough in naked rocks. Thus, in peril and plight, the night travels on until Christmas Eve and to Mary he makes his moan, that she may direct him to some abode. On the morn he arrives at an immense forest, wondrously wild, surrounded by high hills on every side. 
where he found hoary oaks full huge, a hundred together. The hazel and the hawthorn intermingled were all overgrown with moss. Upon their boughs sat many sad birds that piteously piped for pain of the cold. Gawain besought the Lord and Mary to guide him to some habitation where he might hear mass. Scarcely had he crossed himself thrice when he perceived a dwelling in the wood set upon a hill. It was the loveliest castle that he had ever beheld. It was pitched on a prairie, with a park all around it, enclosing many a tree for more than two miles. It shone as the sun through the bright oaks. Gawain urges on his steed Gringolet, and finds himself at the chief gate. He called aloud, and soon there appeared a porter on the wall who demanded his errand. "'Good sir,' quoth Gawain, "'wouldst thou go to the high lord of this house and crave a lodging for me?' "'Yeah, by Peter,' replied the porter. "'Well, I know that thou art welcome to dwell here as long as thou likest.' The drawbridge is soon let down, and the gates opened wide to receive the knight. Many noble ones hasten to bid him welcome. They take away his helmet, sword, and shield. Many a proud one presses forward to do him honor. They bring him into the hall, where a fire was brightly burning upon the hearth. Then the lord of the land comes from his chamber and welcomes Sir Gawain telling him that he is to consider the place as his own. Our knight is next conducted to a bright bower. Where was noble bedding, curtains of pure silk with golden hems and tarsic tapestries upon the wall and the floors? Here the knight doffed his armour and put on rich robes, which so well became him that all declared that a more comely knight Christ had never made. A table is soon raised, and Gawain, having washed, proceeds to meet. Many dishes are set before him, sows of various kinds, fish of all kinds, some baked in bread, others broiled on the embers, some boiled, others seasoned with spices. The knight expresses himself well pleased and calls it a most noble and princely feast. After dinner, in reply to numerous questions, he tells his host that he is Gawain, one of the knights of the round table. When this was made known, great was the joy in the hall. Each one said softly to his companion, Now we shall see courteous behavior, and learn the terms of noble discourse, since we have amongst us that fine father of nurture. Truly God has highly favored us in sending us such a noble guest as Sir Gawain. At the end of the Christmas festival, Gawain desires to take his departure from the castle, but his host persuades him to stay, promising to direct him to the Green Chapel about two miles from the castle, that he may be there by the appointed time. A covenant is made between them, the terms of which were that the lord of the castle should go out early to the chase, that Gawain meanwhile should lie in his loft at his ease and rise at his usual hour. Afterwards, sit at a table with his hostess, and that at the end of the day they should make an exchange of whatever they might obtain in the interim. Whatever I win in the wood, says the Lord, shall be yours, and what thou gettest shall be mine. Full early before daybreak, the folk uprise, saddle their horses, and truss their mails. The noble lord of the land, arrayed for riding, eats hastily a sop and having heard mass, proceeds with a hundred hunters to hunt the wild deer. All this time Gawain lies in his gay bed. His nap is disturbed by a little noise at the door which is softly opened. He heaves up his head out of the clothes, and peeping through the curtains, beholds a most lovely lady, the wife of the host. She came towards the bed and the knight laid himself down quickly, pretending to be asleep. The lady stole to the bed, cast up the curtains, crept within, sat her softly on the bedside, and waited some time till the knight should awake. After lurking a while under the clothes, considering what it all meant, Gawain unlocked his eyelids, 
and put on a look of surprise, at the same time making the sign of the cross as if afraid of some hidden danger. "'Good morrow, sir,' said the fair lady. "'Ye are a careless sleeper to let one enter thus. "'I shall bind you in your bed, of that ye be sure.' "'Good morrow,' quoth Gawain. "'I shall act according to your will with great pleasure, "'but permit me to rise that I may more comfortably converse with you.' "'Nay, beau sir,' said the sweet one, "'ye shall not rise from your bed. "'For since I have caught my knight, I shall hold talk with him.' I ween well that ye are Sir Gawain, that all the world worships, whose honour and courtesy are so greatly praised. Now ye are here, and we are alone. My lord and his men being afar off, other men too are in bed, so are my maidens. The door is safely closed. I shall use my time well while it lasts. Ye are welcome to my person, to do with it as ye please, and I will be your servant. Gawain behaves most discreetly, for the remembrance of his forthcoming adventure at the Green Chapel prevents him from thinking of love. At last the lady takes leave of the knight, by catching him in her arms and kissing him. The day passes away merrily, and at dusk the lord of the castle returns from the chase. He presents the venison to Gawain according to the previous covenant between them. Our knight gives his host a kiss as the only piece of good fortune that had fallen to him during the day. "'It is good,' says the other, "'and would be much better if you would tell me where you won such bliss.' "'That was not in our covenant,' replies Gawain, "'so try me no more.' After much laughing on both sides, they proceed to supper, and afterwards, while the choice wine is being carried around, Gawain and his host renew their agreement. Late at night they take leave of each other and hasten to their beds. By the time that the cock had crowed and cackled thrice, the lord was up, and after meat and mass were over, the hunters make for the woods, where they give chase to a wild boar who had grown old and mischievous. While the sportsmen are hunting this wild swine, our lovely knight lies in his bed. He is not forgotten by the lady who pays him an early visit, seeking to make further trial of his virtues. She sits softly by his side and tells him that he has forgotten what she taught him the day before. I taught you of kissing, says she, that becomes every courteous knight. Gawain says he must not take that which is forbidden him. The lady replies that he is strong enough to enforce his own wishes. Our knight answers that every gift not given with good will is worthless. His fair visitor then inquires how it is that he who is so skilled in the true sport of love, and so renowned a knight, has never talked to her of love. You ought, she says, to show and teach a young thing like me some tokens of true love's crafts. I come hither and sit here alone to learn of you some game. Do teach me of your wit while my lord is from home. Gawain replies that he cannot undertake the task of expounding true love and tales of arms to one who has far more wisdom than he possesses. Thus did our knight avoid all appearance of evil, though sorely pressed to do what was wrong. The lady, having bestowed two kisses upon Sir Gawain, takes her leave of him. At the end of the day, the lord of the castle returns home, with the shields and head of the wild boar. He shows them to his guest, who declares that such a brawn of a beast, nor such sides of a swine, he never before has seen. Gawain takes possession of the spoil according to covenant, and in return bestows two kisses upon the host, who declares that his guest has indeed been rich. After much persuasion, Gawain consents to stop at the castle another day. Early on the morrow, the lord and his men hasten to the woods and come upon the track of a fox, the hunting of which affords them plenty of employment and sport. Meanwhile, our good knight sleeps soundly with his comely curtains. He is again visited by the lady of the castle. So gaily was she attired and so faultless of her features that great joy warmed the heart of Sir Gawain. 
With soft and pleasant smiles they smite into mirth, and are soon engaged in conversation. Had not Mary thought of her knight, he would have been in great peril. So sorely does the fair one press him with her love, that he fears lest he should become a traitor to his host. The lady inquires whether he has a mistress to whom he has plighted his troth. The knight swears by St. John that he neither has nor desires one. This answer causes the dame to sigh for sorrows. In telling him she must depart, she asks for some gift, if it were only a glove, by which she might think on the knight and lessen her grief. Gawain assures her that he has nothing worthy of her acceptance, that he is on an uncouth errand, and therefore has no men with no males containing precious things, for which he is truly sorry. Though I had naught of yours, yet should ye have of mine. Thus saying, she offers him a rich ring of red gold, with a shining stone standing aloft, that shone like the beams of the bright sun. The knight refused the gift as he had nothing to give in return. Since ye refuse my ring, says the lady, because it seems too rich and ye would not be beholden to me, I shall give you my girdle, that is less valuable. But Gawain replies that he will not accept gold or reward of any kind, though, ever in hot and in cold, he will be her true servant. Do ye refuse it, asks the lady, because it seems simple and of little value. Whoso knew the virtues that are knit therein would estimate it more highly. For he who is girded with this green lace cannot be wounded or slain by any man under heaven. The knight thinks a while, and it strikes him that this would be a jewel for the jeopardy that he had to undergo at the green chapel. So he not only accepts the lace, but promises to keep the possession of it a secret. By that time the lady had kissed him thrice, and she then takes her leave and leaves him there. Gawain rises, dresses himself in noble array, and conceals the love lace where he might find it again. He then hies to mass, shrives him of his misdeeds, and obtains absolution. On his return to the hall, he solaces the ladies with comely carols and all kinds of joy. The dark night came, and then the lord of the castle, having slain the fox, returns to his dear home where he finds a fire brightly turning and his guest amusing the ladies. Gawain, in fulfilment of his agreement, kisses his host thrice. By Christ, quoth the other knight, ye have caught much bliss. I have hunted all this day, and naught have I got but the skin of this foul fox. The devil have the goods. And that is full poor for to pay for such precious things. After the usual evening's entertainment, Gawain retires to rest. The next morning, being New Year's Day, is cold and stormy. Snow falls and the dales are full of drift. Our knight in his bed locks his eyelids, but full little he sleeps. By each cock that crows he knows the hour. And before daybreak he calls for his chamberlain, who quickly brings him his armour. While Gawain clothed himself in his rich weeds, he forgot not the lace, the lady's gift. But with it doubly girded his loins. He wore it not for its rich ornaments, but to save himself when it behooved him to suffer, and as a safeguard against sword or knife. Having thanked his host and all the renowned assembly for the great kindness he had experienced at their hands, he steps into stirrups and strides aloft. The drawbridge is let down, the broad gates unbarred and borne upon both sides, and the knight, after commending the castle to Christ, passes there out and goes on his way accompanied by his guide, that should teach him to turn to that place where he should receive the much dreaded blow. They climb over cliffs where each hill had a hat and a mist cloak until the next morn, when they find themselves full high hill covered with snow. The servant bids his master remain a while, saying, I have brought you hither at this time, 
and now ye are not far from that noted place that ye have so often inquired after. The place that ye press to is esteemed full perilous. There dwells a man in that waste, the worst upon earth, for he is stiff and stern and loves to strike, and greater is he than any man upon Middle Earth, and his body is bigger than the best four in Arthur's house. He keeps the green chapel. There passes none by that place, however proud in arms, that he does not ding him to death with a dint of his hand. He is a man immoderate and no mercy uses. For be it churl or chaplain that by the chapel rides, monk or mass priest or any man else, it is as pleasant to him to kill them as to go alive himself. Wherefore I tell thee truly, come ye there, ye be killed, though ye had twenty lives to spend. He has dwelt there long of yore, and on field much sorrow has wrought. Against his sword dints ye may not defend you. Therefore, good Sir Gawain, let the man alone, and for God's sake go by some other path, and then I shall hie me home again, I swear to you. God and all his saints that I will never say that I ever ye attempted to flee from any man. Gawain thanks his guide for his well-meant kindness, but declares that to the green chapel he will go, though the owner thereof be a stern knave, for God can devise means to save his servants. Mary, quoth the other, since it please thee to lose thy life, I will not hinder thee, have thy helmet on thy head, thy spear in thy hand. Ride down this path by yon rock side till thou be brought to the bottom of the valley. Then look a little on the plain. On thy left hand thou shalt see in the slade the chapel itself, the burly knight that guards it. Now farewell, Gawain the noble. For all the gold upon the ground I would not go with thee, nor bear thee fellowship through this wood on foot farther. Thus having spoken, he gallops away and leaves the knight alone. Gawain now pursues his journey, rides through the dale and looks about. He sees no signs of a resting place, but only high and steep banks. The very shadows of the high woods seemed wild and distorted. No chapel, however, could he discover. After a while he sees a round hill by the side of a stream. Thither he goes, alights, and fastens his horse to the branch of a tree. He walks about the hill, debating with himself what it might be. It had a hole in the one end on each side, and everywhere overgrown with grass, but whether it was only an old cave or a crevice of an old crag he could not tell. Now indeed, quoth Gawain, a desert is here, this oratory is ugly, with herbs overgrown. It is a fitting place for the man in green to deal here his devotions after the devil's manner. Now I feel it is the fiend in my five wits that is convenated with me, that he may destroy me. This is a chapel of misfortune, evil betide it. It is the most cursed kirk that ever I came in. With his helmet on his head and his spear in his hand, he roams up to the rock, and hears from that high hill beyond the brook a wondrous wild noise. Lo, it clattered in the cliff as if one upon a grindstone were grinding a scythe. It whirred like the water at a mill and rushed and re-echoed terrible to hear. Though my life I forego, says Gawain, no noise shall cause me to fear. Then he cried aloud, who dwells in this place, discourse with me to hold. For now is good Gawain going right here, if any brave wight will hie him hither, either now or never. Abide, quoth one on the bank above over his head, and thou shalt have all in haste that I promised thee once. Soon there comes out of a hole in the crag, with a fell weapon, a Danish axe quite new, the man in the green, clothed as at first as his legs, locks, and beard, but now he is on foot and walks on the earth. 
When he reaches the stream, he hops over and boldly strides about. He meets Sir Gawain, who tells him he's quite ready to fulfill his part of the compact. Gawain, quoth the green gom, may God preserve thee. Truly thou art welcome to my place, and thou hast timed thy travel as a true man should. Thou knowest the covenants made between us at this time twelve months that on New Year's Day that I should return thee thy blow. We are now in this valley by ourselves and can do as we please. Have therefore thy helmet off thy head and have here thy pay. Let us have no more talk than when thou didst strike off my head with a single blow. Nay, by God, quoth Gawain, I shall not begrudge thee thy will for any harm that may happen, but will stand still whilst thou strikest. Then he stoops a little, and shows his bare neck, unmoved by any fear. The green knight takes up his grim tool and with all the force raises it aloft, as if he meant utterly to destroy him. As the axe came gliding down, Gawain shrank a little with the shoulders from the sharp iron. The other withheld his weapon and then reproved the prince with many proud words. Thou art not Gawain that is so good esteemed, that never feared for no host by hill nor by vale. For now thou fleest for fear before thou feelst harm. Such cowardice of that night did I never hear. I never flinched nor fled when thou didst aim at me in King Arthur's house. My head flew to my feet, and yet I never fled. Wherefore I deserve to be called the better man. Quoth Gawain, I shunted once, but will do so no more, though my head may fall on the stones. But hasten and bring me to the point. Deal me my destiny, and do it out of hand. For I shall stand thee a stroke, and start no more until thine axe has hit me. Here have my troth. Have at thee then, said the other, and heaves the axe aloft and looks as savagely as if he were mad. He aims at the other mightily, but withholds his hand ere it might hurt. Gawain readily abides the blow without flinching with any member, and stood still as a stone or a tree, fixed in rocky ground with a hundred roots. Then merrily did the other speak. Since now thou hast thy heart whole, it behoves me to strike. So take care of thy neck. Gawain answers with great wrath. Thrash on, thou fierce man, thou threatens too long. I believe thy own heart fails thee. Forsooth, quoth the other, since thou speakest so boldly, I will no longer delay. Then contracting both lips and brow, he made ready to strike and let fall his axe on the bare neck of Sir Gawain. Though hammered fiercely, he only severed the hide, causing blood to flow. When Gawain saw his blood on the snow, he seized his helmet and placed it on his head, then drew out his bright sword and thus angrily spoke, Cease, man, of thy blow bid me no more. I have received a stroke in this place without opposition, but if thou givest any more readily shall I requite thee. Of that be thou sure. Our covenant stipulates one stroke, therefore now cease. The green knight resting on his axe looks on Sir Gawain. As bold and fearless he there stood, and with a loud voice thus addresses the knight. Bold knight, be not so wroth. No man here has wronged thee. I promised thee a stroke, and thou hast it. Hold thee well pleased. I could have dealt much worse with thee, and caused thee much sorrow. Two blows I aimed at thee, for twice thou kissest my fair wife. But I struck thee not, because thou restoredest to me, according to agreement. At the third time thou failedst and therefore I have given thee that tap. That woven girdle given thee by my own wife belongs to me. I know well thy kisses, thy conduct also, and the wooing of my wife, for I wrought it myself, I sent her to try thee. 
and truly methinks thou art the most faultless man that ever on foot went. Still, sir, thou wert wanting in good faith, but as it proceeded from no immorality, thou being only desirous of saving thy life, the less I blame thee. Gawain stood confounded. The blood rushed into his face, and he shrank within himself for very shame. Cursed, he cried. Be cowardice and covetousness both. In you a villainy and vice that virtue destroy. He takes off the girdle and throws it to the knight in green, cursing his cowardice and covetousness. The green knight, laughing, thus spoke. Thou hast confessed so clean and acknowledged thy faults, that I hold thee as pure as thou hast never forfeited since thou wast first born. I give thee, sir, the gold-hemmed girdle, as a token of thy adventure at the Green Chapel. Come now to my castle, we shall enjoy together the festivities of New Year. Nay, forsooth, quoth the knight, but for your kindness may God requite you. Commend me to that courteous one, your comely wife, who with her crafts has beguiled me. But it is no uncommon thing for a man to come to sorrow through women's wiles. For so was Adam beguiled with one, and Solomon with many, and Samson was destroyed by Delilah. It were indeed great bliss for a man to love them well and believe them not. Since the greatest upon earth was so beguiled, methinks I should be excused. But God reward you for your girdle, which I will ever wear in remembrance of my fault. And when pride shall exalt me, a look to this lovely shall lessen it. But since ye are the lord of yonder land, from whom I have received so much honour, tell me truly your right name, and I shall ask no more questions. I am called Bernlac de Haut Desert through might of Morgan the Fay, who dwells in my house. Much she has learnt of Merlin, who knows all your knights at home. She brought me to your hall, for to essay the prowess of the round table. She wrought this wonder to bereave you of your wits, hoping to have grieved Guinevere and affrighted her to death by means of the man that spoke with his head in his hand before the high table. She is even thine aunt, Arthur's half-sister. Wherefore come to thine aunt, for all my household love thee. Gawain refuses to accompany the Green Knight, and so with many embraces and kind wishes they separate, the one to his castle, the other to Arthur's court. After passing through many wild ways, our knight recovers from the wound in his neck and at last comes safe and sound to the court of King Arthur. Great, then, was the joy of all. The king and queen kiss their brave knight. Many make inquiries about his journey. He tells them of his adventures, hiding nothing. The chance of the chapel, the cheer of the knight, the love of the lady, and lastly of the lace. Groaning for grief and shame, he shows them the cut in his neck, which he had received for unfaithfulness. The king and his courtiers comfort the knight. They laugh loudly at his adventures and unanimously agree that those lords and ladies that belong to the round table and each knight of the brotherhood should ever after wear a bright green belt for Gawain's sake, and he upon whom it was conferred honoured it evermore after. And that is where we close the book on the Green Knight, as it is the end of the story.